Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to have everyone here. Um, so that we, we can move forward, and I don't say uh, uh, just what is written about everyone, I'll give a chance for everyone to introduce themselves in the panel. Um, we are very happy to have everybody on this online supervision, a conversation by and for supervisors and students. Um, uh, today, the 18th, of course. <laughs> um, we have Dr. Nicola Pellet, who is from uh, Rhodes University. We have Enric uh, Pinslow. I'm sure I'm pronouncing your name right, but you'll uh, do that for us. And then we have Isabel uh, Dupree. So uh, we'll start with um, Isabel. We'll go to Nicola, then we'll go to Enric. Kindly introduce yourself, Isabel. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm working at the online and distance unit of the University um, of the Free State. I'm an instructional designer, and I've just recently enrolled for uh, the Masters in Higher Ed Studies under Nicola. So um, I'm the newbie on the panel, I guess. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Um, 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 welcome, and we are definitely going to have fun. Um, like I said, I'm sorry I don't have my my um, my camera on, so you'll bear with me because of situations. Uh, we'll go to Nicola. Kindly introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm Nicola Pallet, and I uh, just moved here to uh, uh, moved to Rhodes uh, University this year. Uh, I was previously at UCT, which, which is where I met Heinrich, and uh, was co-supervising him with Dr. Cheryl Brown at UCT. Uh, and he's just submitted and had got the results for his uh, master's dissertation. He passed his dissertation with distinction. So we're very, very, <laughs> um, very proud and very happy. And Isabel has just joined me, as she said, um, uh, as a student here at Rhodes University. I um, just want to say that I haven't met either of them uh, face to face. Uh, so it's, it's quite interesting. And we're going to be sharing a bit about our journey together. Over to Heinrich. Hi everyone. Yeah, I think I think that's the most interesting part, isn't it, Nicola? I think if I walk in pick and pay and you walk past me, we won't even recognize one another. So what a what a fantastic journey it's been. My name is Heinrich Prinzler. Um, I work for CTL, Center for Teaching and Learning, here at Kofsis University of the Free State. Uh, some of you might know Tiana van der Merwe and uh, Francois Stradon. That's my direct. And uh, yeah, so. Instructional design is what I do and study here and there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, uh, you'll notice that we have uh, the bell that will be ringing throughout as people join us. So uh, just ignore it. Just, just make sure that you don't think about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to hand over to the presenters because there is a way that you've um, organized yourselves. Um, I'll be collecting the questions in the chat and if there's anything that I need to bring to your attention, I will. Uh, please over to you as you had uh, organized uh, the person to start. Please go ahead. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm first it seems. Um, so why online supervision? So I guess looking at the question initially, you would suppose that it's an easy answer, but it's, it's, it's quite complex to, to answer someone when they ask you why online supervision. And I'm going to use an example of my mother-in-law. So my mother-in-law is 76 years old, and I think she's, she's probably asked me this question about a million times. Heinrich, why online supervision? Why study at a different institution you are surrounded by great researchers here at, in Bloemfontein, here at Kofsis. Why, why would you do it uh, online? So the first thing that I would say is that in this field of educational technology, it's become very, very specialized. And, and I think a lot of people in the room today will agree with me that the field has, is quite diverse, but finding an expert in, in the field becomes very, very so trying to find that, that expert in your own institution is a bit problematic at times. 
Um, and as we all know, if, if you're doing a master's degree, specifically if you're an instructional designer, the only thing that's really going to keep you motivated is finding a niche or a field that you really enjoy. So finding, finding the, the correct person to join you in that, in that journey is very important. And I do think online supervision um, gives you a great opportunity for that. The second reason that, that online supervision is such a such a for me is the institutional offering can really be limiting. So what I have encountered is that a lot of institutions sort of offer online supervision. But once you, once you sort of dive into the, the, the <laughs> of some of those some of those offerings, you find that there's there's um are we fine with the audio? I'm, I'm hearing funny things. Okay, cool. So when when you look at institution offerings, they do say that it's fully online supervision, but then you start reading things like block sessions and specific programs that you need to follow. Now, that, that can really be, be very difficult to attend to, specifically when you're a professional in the field. Um, another thing that's very important, I think, that gets neglected specifically by um, people in the more academic field of, of universities is that uh, traditionally your support service personnel don't share the same study benefits. So um, studying uh, um, at, at your own institution or at a different institution where you have to have face-to-face -face block sessions or a strict program becomes very problematic as you would have to take your own personal leave to attend to some of those uh, commitments. And then lastly, what I'd say, uh, and I know we're millennials and we're Generation X or whatever you want to call us, but flexibility is essential for us to survive. So in my specific field as an instructional designer, this last week has been incredibly hectic. And I'm sure most of, of the people around the table will, will agree with me. There are times in our field that we really can't study. And you need a, a supervision structure, an online supervision structure that allows you just to be flexible. I've got two kids and a third child on the way. Um, and sometimes life just happens and it's impossible to study. But online supervision uh, created a space for me to study fully when I could. And those times where I was just surviving as a parent and as a, as a professional, um, I was able to, to restructure and rethink. So in short, those are, are, are the reasons uh, uh, why online supervision worked for me. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think we move on to the next one, please. Okay, guys. So um, this is all about how supervision um, happens in our context and what the role of the supervisor and the student is, I would like you to, as I go through my um, slide or my thoughts, for you to comment in the chat box to, um, for us to see what, what you guys think the roles um, should be. So um, for me, whether supervision is face-to-face -face or um, online, um, it's all about the relationship um, for me. Now, when I think back of Nicholas and um, my first meeting, it was obviously the icebreaker meeting. Um, she invited me through Adobe uh, Connect for an informal chat, which um, uh, ended up being two hours. So we just chatted away. And um, needless to say that this might be the most important meeting ever between a supervisor and a student because um, it sets the scene. I think it was important for both of, both of us um, to also get a feel for uh, one another. Um, I was looking for a connection and I was lucky to find it. Um, I might just mention that Rose, Rose appointed her um, to me, so I didn't um, uh, go out to look for a supervisor on my um, own. So it was um, almost... Um, when we spoke that I could sense that uh, this is my person and because it was a serious commitment or it's still, yeah, it's a serious commitment for me, I was hoping to find a committed person as well. So it was awkward at first using um, this tool, but I was hoping to, yeah, but I, uh, she immediately put me um, to ease. She helped me 
during the first meeting we had of I think back now, she put me at ease and she took me through all the thought processes. Um, I wasn't sure of my topic, but she facilitated. And um, without making decisions on my behalf, which I appreciate. And then from there, um, we took on the form of various communications, um, email, um, WhatsApp. Um, some of them I'm still figuring out on Google Drive. And um, I think the fact that we've been in constant communication um, also helps us to, because we're still new, to establish the rhythm of the process. Um, but I think we, we still need to um, piece that out a bit as well. So um, the human factor is on the one side, but then you can also not shy away um, that this is a professional agreement um, between the supervisor and the student. And in my opinion, it can still be, although it's a professional agreement, it still can be tailored to fit both individuals' needs to a certain point. So it depends on both parties' willingness also to adapt to one another's, um, say, for instance, preferences. So I feel that the supervisor on the one hand can bend a bit and use the student should also be able to adapt. If I can think now of an, an example, that um, it would be um, Heinrich's example of the feedback. He prefers maybe sketches to um, track changes. I'm a more of a track changes kind of person and Nicola's fine with um, both. So for, and also um, I have to adapt now with the different um, technologies Nicola's bringing to the table. Um, yeah, to embrace that from her side as well. So I think the bottom line is that there should be a mutual agreement um, throughout the process between two of the two of you. And I think also to ensure this is by constant communication with one another, um, openness and mutual respect for one another's positions. So um, yeah, I see Karen, yeah, I see in your case, the student picks the supervisor and sometimes it works versa vice. So there should be a report created, a human relationship is important. Yes, I totally agree. I chose my supervisor. Maybe you can tell us how that worked out. Okay, so um, I would say for a supervisor, uh, a good supervisor, I'd say, cultivates a positive relationship um, with his or a student and they will try to sustain it. So it is someone who does not only know what his or her role um her roles are, but also one with, that has the wisdom to know how and when to take on which role, to know when, which hat to wear. Um, I think Quinn sums up the supervisor's role beautifully. If we can go to the next slide. Um, we've got the one of Balekiles there, but Quinn sums it up beautifully. Um, he says that a supervisor is an innovator, a broker, a producer, a director, coordinator, monitor, and a facilitator. So that's quite a mouthful. So, um, yeah, you can read what Volkinus say about the ideal supervisor there as well. And we would love to hear your thoughts on it. Now, the student. Um, the student's role is equally important. I think uh, the student should be disciplined. They um, should um, accept the guidance of the supervisor. They should carefully plan and prepare for meetings, do their homework. They sub should stick to the deadlines as far as they can, submit their work frequently, and always discuss and brainstorm wherever um, needed. Uh, thank you, Heinrich and Peter.
Oh, you guys say that you would like to choose your supervisor. That one was allocated. Yeah. I don't know, Nicola, what, what do you think about our panel's comments? Um, it's a tough one because, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, you, you click with, you, you have a person in mind, um, but they might not be available or, you know, everyone has this, I mean, it differs from institution to institution. You choose your supervisor based on shared research interests or at other uh, spaces, you just apply to the institution and whoever there is a good fit or you kind of know perhaps who is at whichever institution and that you're likely to get X and Y uh, person as supervisors. So it really, it does differ from institution to institution. Uh, I think for me, this, this quote, um, it's interesting because like as Isabel has said, it's a two, two way process, you know, in this relationship. Actually, this, both the student and the supervisor have um, roles to play. And, you know, Karen notices, I think, the, the importance, you know, in her comment in the, te in the text chat about uh, not just creativity, but uh, being sort of, flex you know, flexibility being crucial as well. So what I liked about this quote, and I'm not claiming to be an ideal supervisor, you know, or the perfect supervisor at all. Like I said to Heinrich and Isabel, look, we're not going to say anything about, you know, how great, um, you know, you know, we are, but more about sort of, we want to keep the conversation about uh, the process. Uh, and I'm very much still learning in my supervision journey. Um, but I, I, I've come to appreciate that this second part is probably the most important, knowing when to do things and moving between different different functions. So that brought me to, I did a post-grad supervision course here at Rhodes University. And one of the readings I got was, uh, you know, we did was by Lee. And it was, you know, they're basically there are different super, uh, dimensions of super supervision. So supervisors, you know, there might be things that, uh, you know, particular dimensions that resonate with you. Are you a functional supervisor? Do you, are you very much about enculturating your students? Is it about emancipation? But so you can use it as kind of like self-assessment, but also realizing that they might, you might be, in different dimensions uh, with the student at different parts of the research journey. Um, so I think it, it was very helpful, but I thought, you know, there's room to actually um, flesh these out uh, when you talk about online supervision. And there's some things about these dimensions that I actually, I realized I didn't really like, like diagnosis of de deficiencies. Like I didn't, I don't actually like the idea of, you know, thinking ahead of, you know, like just deciding that the student has X and Y, you know, seeing it as a deficiency. Um, so I think, but, but it's a good uh, tool to think with. Uh, and to reflect about our supervision uh, practices. And that it's got, you know, what is the supervisor doing? What is the students doing? What are you, what are you drawing on? Um, those are very sort of important in, in, this, in this work. So now, um, and if we will share the reading uh, in, the, in the references, you can go and have a sort of deeper, deeper look. Um, <laughs> Karen says, is saying you're not that bad, not the same as saying you're great. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, what I've realized is it's, 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 we're all learning, whether there are emerging, you know, novice supervisors or experienced supervisors, um, you know, you can learn from each other and also you learn a lot from your students. Um, that, that's what I've found. I'm going to hand over to Heinrich, who's going to talk a bit more about the sort of how does it happen um, of online supervision and push the sort of Lee's dimensions a little bit more. Okay, over to you, Heinrich. Thank you, my not so not too bad supervisor. I appreciate 
it. Um, so yeah, let's 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 look at the the way that it does happen. So um, more practically, what does it mean? Uh, what is different from from a face to face environment? What is meant by a synchronous and asynchronous? Uh, and what what does the support typically look like? I think what's important to just mention here before I get started, this is probably going to be my story. It's not going to be the next person's story. So it's very individual. And as Corin has also mentioned, it changes all, all the time. So you move into to different dimensions as, as the support goes, goes on. Um, people that works in educational technology, I think the assumption that we make is that the use of educational technology will happen seamlessly and that there won't be any issues. This, is, this can't be further from the truth. So um, what my experience was with, with the online supervision initially is that some of the educational technology that we made use of initially overwhelmed me, initially made certain things difficult. And that's, I guess, where the, where the adaptability of, of a supervisor is so incredibly important. So what we did is um, there, there's, there's still specific emotions that, that, that's attached to having a meeting with someone. There's still a human element that occurs when, when you're meeting with a supervisor. So I, th I think in terms of certain silences that might occur in an online meeting, for instance, might indicate that a student is overwhelmed. So when Nicola at times set certain guidelines or certain goals and objectives, um, my silence some, sometimes sort of told a, a story about my human emotions. So it's very important to understand that how this all happens does have to do with a lot of educational technology but the human element is not removed. So the feelings of being overwhelmed, being demotivated, not knowing what to do and how to write academically, all those aspects that you traditionally experience in a master's study or in, online, or in supervision does also occur in an online environment. So what this table um, summarizes is um, just some of the tools that, that was used during my supervision so synchronously meeting uh, live usually occurred through Adobe Connect and Zoom like we're meeting now. Um, feedback was usually shared in the online meeting through Google Docs. Planning was done in the chat box of Adobe Connect and reading was usually shared through Google Drive. So those are sort of those live uh, things that happened when, when Nicola, Nicola and I sort of joined online. Asynchronously, uh, we made use of lots of emails. Uh, we made use of WhatsApp Quite quite a lot, and, and Nicola can share some of some of her experiences later on, and I'm sure Isabel as well. Commitments towards specific tasks. Uh, we made use of due dates, calendar events, sort of reminders that popped up in my calendar um, that showed me where I should be. Timelines and word word etc. Written feedback, and we'll get to that in a moment as one of my practical examples. Um, and then sharing of documents occurred through through Google Drive. So very practically, I want to show you what, what all of this meant through, through two examples, uh, one of handwritten scans and the, the second example of um, uh, online meetings. So if we can just move to the next slide. Awesome. So here's quite, a, quite an interesting thing of, of myself. I absolutely hate track changes. I can't stand it. So nothing against technology, but... What I hate about track changes is it, it doesn't provide me uh, and my personality with an influence towards better writing. It doesn't allow me a creativity. It doesn't allow me to see something differently. It's just purely word notes on a document. So Nicola picked this up quite quickly in our, in our supervising relationship. And what she realized is if she allows me to see certain things in a specific that really motivates me to write better, but it also motivates me to argue in a visual manner. So this is an example of chapter one, my first draft, and she sort of pulled me back to some of the key things that I need to think about. Uh, and the next slide, if we can just share that, please. This was also um, Nicola and I sort of uh, getting getting myself immersed, emerged into, into better writing is, uh, methodology, the research design, what is it all about, what am I contributing to the study, etc. So this can be done in, 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 uh, in notes and in a Word doc and etc. But this really um, helped me a great deal to start understanding how Nicola thinks and how I think. So those are two examples of how that occurred. Last, the last thing I want to share with you as a practical example of, of how this happened 
is this is an example of an Adobe Connect Room, which I'm sure everyone around the table is very familiar with. Um, but there are times that, that it also is very specific things that, that, that you share. So this was in, in our final phase of, of my research um, and looking at, at the external moderator's comments and, and fixing some of the, of, of the language and technical concerns and references. So um, it's, it's an array of things that at, 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 at times and the technology use will differ from student to student, but it's incredibly important to feel comfortable with the technology because the moment you as a student and a supervisor start feeling uh, disjointed in the technology, I think that's when things can really go wrong. Okay, guys, um, this was one of our first exchanges between um, yeah, me and Nicola when we first um, started up. Um, it's an email correspondence. Um, so if you read through it, um, you can clearly see how she, yeah, well, I have to make it personal now, Nicola, so please forgive me. So you can clearly see how she um, guided me. Um, and encouraged me, yeah, and there, but also um, building my um, confidence. Um, she also shares a lot of resources, um, which were a bit overwhelming to me, but then she followed up as, as soon as she, uh, she sent it, she followed up by making it available on Google um, Docs. So she's also indirectly um, giving direction to my organization skills um, as well. So sometimes I think supervision is, uh, has a lot to do about the hidden curricula as well. So she's um, also creating space here for me, if you read through this, um, to work with my, to work through my own thought processes. And she's not forcing any of her um, thoughts or opinions on me and not giving me a deadline here. And um, we are also negotiating um, turning in of works and um, meeting um, times here. So if we can maybe go to the next one. Yeah, this was a WhatsApp between me and her. Um, so here she also sends my um, anxiety because I had to attend Nadi Hosa. So she called me in a bit and um, she, yeah, also felt a little bit overwhelmed, but you can see her guiding role here as well. She's again um, backing up with, she's got resources handy for me. And this tells me that she knows when to give what resources at, what, at which stage. And this to me is a sign of confidence. So, um, and that in itself is also contributing to my confidence when I know that my supervisor is also confident in what I have to do um, next. And then the last bit, you can also see where she, um, when I ask her about Mendeley, she's totally fine with me choosing my own um, uh, choice of um, software. So that also demonstrates her openness um, to choice. Okay, I think we can move on. Okay, right, it's me again. Um, so the, the interesting thing is, the, or, the, or the opportunities that I felt is available, and I think for supervisors, Nicola needs to jump in, but from a student perspective and a student that is finished, um, there's a, there's a couple of things that, that I think is very important to understand about online supervision and the things that it does create that I don't necessarily think would happen in a traditional face-to-face -face manner. So the first thing is that your own institution creates an opportunity for students to have access to researchers. But the moment you start studying in an online supervision environment, you sort of push the boundaries quite a lot. Now, I remember when I was studying at, at UCT and now even with, with Nicola's connect, connectiveness at, at Rhodes, um, people like Tony, who, who's here today, some, some, some of the things that he said uh, and some of her colleagues contributed certain things, uh, not even knowingly, to my research just by speaking to, to Nicola about, about certain specific things. So you, you really have a, a hidden gem that opens up to you 
because you sort of get to know some of the South African researchers uh, out there, which in th traditionally you won't necessarily be, be exposed to if you just stick with your, your own face-to-face uh, -face supervision at, at an institution. So it really makes it possible to, to really jump, jump across those borders. But what it also does, and, and very importantly to your research, I felt that it gave my research more depth. So Nicola and, and um, Cheryl asked me questions about certain things where my research environment was housed. Those questions, I honestly do not think would have been asked if they were from the same institution. So what, what happened is that um, she asked, she saw things that, that I don't think my, myself and my colleagues do see because we are in an institution and institutional um, environment that, that sort of describes some of our actions as normal, whereby bringing someone in from, from the, bigger, the bigger community in edtech uh, helped us to, to, to go a little bit deeper into some of the things that, that I probably would have seen as normal. And then lastly, educational technology experts or professionals or whatever you want to call us um, is, is, is quite a niche and small group. Uh, what I did see as an opportunity for online supervision is that Nicola and I had had a relationship that is student supervisor, but we also had a professional relationship. So in, in terms of me asking certain things about stuff that they do at Rhodes or stuff that they do at UCT when she was still there, uh, really helped me with certain some of my projects as a profession. Um, and she pointed me into the into uh, directions of of thought when when it was applicable really to my work only. So you, you have the opportunity through online supervision to, to also professionally start collaborating with people in the educational technology field, which was really great for me. So a lot of, a lot of opportunities that I don't think is necessarily available um, in a face-to-face -face institutional environment. But Nicola, over to you in, in terms of, of what it means to supervisors. Yeah, I think for me, because it's an emerging field, um, it's really useful. It's really nice having students from other institutions because so you get to learn about, you know, conferences they're offering, like UFS is hosting an Up to You session coming up, um, and uh, which is a sort of more instructional design um, uh, get together. Uh, things like, you know, so there's, there's a lot of things I think that different institutions do and have as a strength, but you don't know about those things unless you speak to someone from there. Um, and I think there was a lot of scope for, you know, being having professional engagements beyond individual views. Um, and this forms part of sort of the broader community building, because we're building a field, but we're also building a community of, people who are educational technology uh, professionals and researchers, or if you want to say practitioner researchers. So that was, that was very, very valuable. And it, it was interesting sort of questioning, you know, through asking questions, then questioning my own assumptions about how things happen at my institution. Uh, so Heinrich's topic was on lecture recording. Um, so it was, it was a very interesting exchange, you know, how does these things happen uh, differently at our institutions? I think we'll move on to the challenges before we get some questions. Um, Okay, yeah. Um, some challenges is definitely uh, that lack of warm body contact. It might sound a little bit strange, but all know what I mean. The lack of face-to-face -face communication and the whole thing of not looking someone in the eye when you speak. Um, it's, it's, and it can be um, very daunting at the, uh, at the beginning stage. And I'm sure you get used to it um, as time passes. Um, then also, um, you can't read someone's body language, and that I think is also um, a, a, a great um, challenge. But I think then honesty and openness um, should come in here, where you must be upfront, and maturity and emotional intelligence here also plays a role, where you have to tell your supervisor 
um, this is how I feel about it, or I feel overwhelmed, or um, I don't have time, or whatever comes up. So we are not mind readers, so we need to speak up. If there's upfront communication, I'm sure we can overcome this challenge. And then also the feeling isolated on an island, left alone. And that's why I also think that um, forums like this really help students to um, yeah, to chat with one another and to just uh, make you feel not so alone in the whole um, process. And then also, um, I think Heinrich, Heinrich touched on this, the funding um, for academics and um, support staff um, the positions, it, it's really, at this stage of my um, studies, it feels literally like I have to jump through burning hoops the whole time just to get all the processes going and the admin stuff. Um, so that is a 24-hour job on its own. So I think um, for supervisors, I think Nicola can say more about this. Yeah, so I, I think it's being aware of the challenges that students are facing. Um, we actually have to do a lot more work uh, supervising online in relation to admin because the student can't just walk around and go to the fees office or go and find out about funding. You know, those become, when you're supervising online, those are part of your job. And, know, and having a list of contacts, you know, who do I direct the person to if they want to know if they have queries about their fees account, um, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, graduation, you know, did the system, you know, get Heinrich's full thesis? <laughs> and, uh, you know, list of corrections, you know, is graduation confirmed for December? You know, <laughs> all those little admin things that, that, you know, we have to, sort of, you know, you have to have, to have the finger on the pulse for those things as well. Um, sometimes also, I think, one of the challenges for me was sort of when we were talking about data, so data analysis uh, and how to organize data. So, you know, you're not sitting next to a student and handling those things physically. Um, so you've got to think about ways that to make sure that you're on the same page and the student understands sort of what you mean. So I tried, you know, sometimes I'd make a drawing, sometimes I'd make a video. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it's, it's thinking, and even if it's a complex question, sometimes it was recording, making a little um, sound recording of a conversation with a more experienced colleague. Um, that was another thing that I tried. Um, yeah, so for super, and, and the data analysis thing, I realized, okay, it actually helps if the supervisor looks through things uh, properly first. So looking through those spreadsheets and then discussing it rather than seeing it for the first time in Adobe Connect, for example. So how you sequence things, um, you've got to really, really think about. Um, the other thing is sort of just being mindful of relationship building, engaging what the student is comfortable with. Not just what, but when. So Heinrich is going to have, you know, he's got two kids and one on the way. I'm not really going to message him in the evening when it's family time. Or, you know, I'd, maybe I'll respond if he messages me, um, but I won't necessarily initiate at that time. Um, and, and also if you haven't heard from the student, sort of checking in, um, how are you? Um, did you see the email from X? You know, little things like that. Um, we did have, I think, some shared challenges as well. Um, and I think the main one of, I mean, we always, you know, things come up that you don't plan that disrupt your access to internet. So now as we speak, I've actually got this, um, you know, room open on two devices because we've had power outages. And I know that at least, you know, then I can jump from one device to another. Uh, so there's a lot of planning and it's like having a plan B in place. Uh, you know, you've always got to think about what, what could happen. Um, so, yeah, that that's, I think... 
part of it. Um, Han, do you want to talk about some advice to students? Yeah, look, I think, I think as, we, uh, as we've learned with the, most of us in, in educational technology, with technology sometimes, not sometimes, in, in almost, almost in all cases, technology has to accentuate certain things. So I think be aware as a student that um, some things will be accentuated in a manner that's not necessarily going to be comfortable. Um, technology really exposes a, a, a lot of elements. So if you're not going to be committed towards technology, if you're not going to be writing and, and reading certain things, there's no hiding from it because I think your, your online supervision creates um, more frequency of, of meeting online, more frequency of, of doing things. So you're not really going to do very well if you don't accept the fact that technology is going to expose um, what you basically do. There's no hiding from, from, from what you're doing in the process. But... I think it's also challenging and important to, to, to train yourself to be comfortable with certain, certain things. To be very honest with you, I would have never, I, I'm not a webcam person and I'm definitely not a webinar person. So it's, it's stuff that's, that's now very comfortable to me. But if you, you asked me three years ago, I would say to you, no way, I prefer face to face. So a lot of the things you make in studying online and, and getting online supervision means that you need to socially and academically start interacting um, in an online manner. And that just means that you need to get out of your comfort zone and, and just step into the deep. Uh, but at the end, of the end of the day, that honesty and, it's honesty and trust between you and your, your supervisor um, to, to share the, those, the, those moments of lack of confidence, those moments of, of demotivation, because if you're not going to share those, those moments uh, your supervisor, in all probability, is just going to move on, not not being able to pick up that that teary eye or that emotion, uh, which is sometimes very difficult to see online. Back to Nicole, I think. Yeah, and I think. Uh, so Heinrich raises something interesting, which is around sort of digital literacies. And I mean, even though Isabel and Heinrich are both, they're both instructional designers, they're in, working in the ed tech field already. There were things that they uh, were not entirely comfortable with or, you know, realized that they had to learn. Like, um, you know, Isabel spoke, she mentioned Google Drive, for example. Um, so too many tools can be overwhelming. So we've got to start, you know, we, I think it's advisable that supervisors just start with the most familiar thing first. Um, you know, it could be email and WhatsApp um, and build from there. Um, and no matter, you know, even if you're not in the ed tech field, um, you know, technology, I mean, even technology is new, even for people in the ed tech field. So imagine people who are not working in that field or don't have that sort of orientation that you need to be agile. So one of the things I think that um, supervising in this way uh, helped us to co-create was this agility um, and, and flexibility, which I think are very important characteristics of the or attributes for the kind of work uh, that we do. Uh, in practice. Um, other advice is, you know, sort of also be, be responsive uh, to your students. Uh, I've already mentioned and know what, the, what they're comfortable with. Uh, but also know, I think, when, when to push. You know, you can, you can, you've got, as a supervisor, I have to be agile as well and tailor your supervision to where students are uh, and sort of knowing where they are, but also know when to, when to challenge them, um, you know. So, for example, Isabel likes, she told me she likes track changes. She's like, oh, no, Heinrich, I could never, you know, <laughs> I'm not like you at all. I don't like the handwritten feedback that's scanned, you know. Um, she likes track changes. So I was like, okay, so she likes track changes. I want to get her into Google Drive. Um, so we're going to try, you know, comments and, 
you know, I think she'll like this kind of thing. Um, you know, the comments and suggestions and those kind of those, those things. Um, yeah. So, and the other thing I want to mention is that it's important to engage with other supervisors and the literature on supervision. Because only when we engage with those do we really start reflecting on our own practices. Um, and, you know, and, and it's very, it's been very helpful for me during this, I'm doing an assignment for the supervision course, but I've been engaging with my students sort of about their experiences and reflecting on different, you know, aspects of the practice, uh, you know, with them as I've been going along. And that's just been so helpful. Um, Cause it's not something one can learn from a book. Uh, there's no recipe. Uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, there's no recipe uh, for supervision. I think as Heinrich and Isabel have both demonstrated that, you know, they had different things uh, that, that worked for them or, or are working for them. Um, so, yes, I know we've got lots of uh, comments, so let's try and get you some of these. Um, I know some folks have come in late. Okay, so Irene had a good has a question around time required. Um, that also depends on I think the student. So Irene were asked how much time is required per week, day, month, um, the real time. Um, <laughs> No, I think we had we might have had an online meeting, say every two weeks, but in between there's WhatsApp conversations, there's feedback on you know three pages. Um, you know, I'm not calculating the time necessarily, um, and I know for the students, I mean Heinrich and Isabel are doing actually much more work. Um, um, So Heinrich, do you want to talk a bit more about uh, your comment here? Yeah, I think just before I get to that comment, just in terms of, of the duration and the time that you spend with your supervisor, I think what, what just as an example is often when I was writing um, a chapter, specifically chapter three methodology, um, there, there are times that you sort of just get stuck. And you just want to ask a simple, basic question. You don't necessarily want to write an email or um, you just want to understand something that just blows your mind. So uh, in Chapter 3, so often there were things that I just, paradigms I just, just couldn't understand initially. So asking those questions just quickly made the difference between me actually just being able to confidently continue in my writing, where it would have been completely different if I stopped my writing, wrote an email, sent the email, wait for a response and then actually get back to the writing. What's up? And you weren't always available, but what's up helped me with those small little questions that I just needed to boost my confidence. Um, then I said, just to respond to the statement that I made about my biggest challenges. And it's, it's not, it's not to uh, say something about the institution that I studied, but um, sometimes uh, UCT really didn't understand that I was in Bloemfontein. So um, just come in or sir, just, just, just send this form or just, just, just send that form. And it's like, where do I get that form? Um, so I think a student that would walk into the office of the humanities would pick up a paper and just submit it. Um, being in Bloemfontein, it's not that simple. And I really want to reiterate that it was a massive challenge at times and, and no criticism against the processes, but I found it, often over and over again that, that people that I phoned did not understand that I was actually in Bloemfontein. And the supervisor, unfortunately, in a sense, had to assist me because I was just not able to, to do certain things without the intervention from, from my supervisor. So there was a big administrative task in a certain sense added to my supervisor, which I think is, is problematic, but, but yet a very real issue in, in, in our study. Uh, perhaps um, we could we could uh, mention 
question about language. There was something about language that you had uh, uh, spoken about. Um, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the language? Because I think that is the way of communication. Um, it was Henrik who had uh, mentioned about that. Perhaps you can tell us about that. Look, yeah, thank you. I, I think it's very important to understand that although we, 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 we live in little bubbles at the end of the day, so Bloemfontein is extremely conservative. I'm sure that most of you that, that's dealt with, with, with um, us as an institution, we, we think very conservatively. It's a lot smaller. We don't live in the buzz and, and, and speed of, for instance, Johannesburg and Cape Town. And we, we speak a very specific English in, in Bloemfontein. So we have a lot of Afrikaners here. And I'm Afrikaans, and it's, 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 it's what I do. But I say, not, not even since initially, when, when I first had my contact with, um, with, with Nicola and, and Cheryl Brown, I was really intimidated by the, the, by the English that they spoke. Just the, just the way that they speak English really intimidated me because we always joke about it, Nicola and I, but um, you say Mendeley and I say Mendeley. So we, we even call software different names uh, because, because of our exposure. But what it can do, it, it can actually intimidate you quite a bit to, to speak freely and to have ideas. And what I found incredibly uh, helpful was the recordings of, of the online sessions that Nicola and I had. So I would hold my pose and pretend to understand every word and then afterwards actually listen to the recording and, and ask a colleague or my wife, what did you do that? <laughs> or look up a word on Wikipedia to, to make sense of it. But the recordings made a, made a big difference in me actually getting my English to a, to a standard that I could actually comfortably communicate uh, with the Cape Townians. Wonderful. Um, um, uh, I think language is quite interesting everywhere. Um, um, in Kenya, we have many kinds of languages. Um, so, um, since we are about seven minutes to, perhaps we can go around um, for the presenters to just uh, have, you know, what is your parting shot? What, what are the things that you'd like to, to so far talk about as, as, as some of the things that have come up from the discussions that we've had? Um, we could start with Isabel. Well, for me, just to hear a fellow colleague that's been through the process really gives me hope. Um, yeah, that there's hope for me um, as well. And that um, the things that I anticipate might be challenges he already went through, or I can hear um, are valid challenges, if I can say, but also has valid um, solutions um, to them. And I guess at the end, it's all about the will to do this. I think if your internal locus of control is um, good enough, I think if you put your mind to it, it's just a matter of do it then. And um, I think we're just very fortunate that the that Nicola has been given to us. And um, yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think uh -huh. the, Nicola wanted to say something, please. Nicola, yes. Yes, I think the language issues and the issue around you know sort of cultures of people, um, but the different you know between supervisor and uh, and student is is actually really interesting and not looked at enough. I think so. I am from a really small Afrikaans town, even though my parents are English, uh, and through you know being at university, obviously that you know, changed how I speak. Um, but I write, there are a lot of things that I write like an Afrikaans person and that my supervisor, when I was doing my PhD, picked up on. And I would, I would it's also about making yourself vulnerable, I think, and, and telling students, look, I did that too. <laughs> Don't worry, just be aware of, you know, you know, start the sentence, foreground the thing that's the most important. And, you know, it's, small, it's very small things, but I think just saying, you know, don't, don't worry about the writing. Like I told Isabel this week, I said, vomit out the words. We'll get to the word, words. We just, you know, but the moment it's about the ideas of expressing, you know, what, 
what you're interested in. Uh, I think there's especially people who are not English first language speakers, but writing, you know, theses in English, the academic writing thing can be very tough. Um, so it's about, I think, how do we, not, you know, work, would not see that it is a barrier. We can't deny that it is a barrier. Um, but how do we get past that? Um, I think is is really important. Um, yeah, I know there have been so many interesting comments and questions in the chat, um, and maybe we can get back to them on the Facebook uh, event page. Because now Irene's got to get to, we've got to get to the facilitating online course, <laughs> and we have some of our colleagues from facilitating online joining. Um, but I want to say a big thanks to Isabel and Heinrich for being brave and talking about this process and, you know, really being honest about the challenges and the difficulties. Um, I mean, our institutions are not, I think, geared towards online supervision or, you know, doing postgrad online things. I mean, even your funding, uh, funding goes to, to people who are full-time students at an institution or you know students who are based in the same country and I, I'm really hoping and looking forward to the day where we can sort of get you know extend beyond that so yeah I hope I hope we've inspired uh, some fellow supervisors and students uh, to think a bit differently about what is uh, you know, just alternative ways of s sort of the supervision uh, relationship and being on the research journey together. Oh, thanks, Peter. Um, Heinrich, Isabel, anything you want to say? You good? Okay, over to you, Irene. I wish to thank all of you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Enric. Thank you, everybody who's been here. I, I think what we are going to do is we're going to pick some of the questions that we didn't quite discuss onto the Facebook page uh, so that the discussion can continue because I think this is a conversation that I think will create another webinar some, uh, in a time to come. So thank you, Nicola, too. Thank you for all the contributions that are here. And I hope we continue this discussion because it's really important. Um, and so as we move on to the Facebook, uh, I hope you'll also join us there. So for now, thank you from Image Africa. Thank you for organizing this and everybody have a good afternoon. Bye for now.